All right. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Griffith Observatory. I feel like I've said that so many times in the last week and a half because this is the last of 16 celebrations that we've had for uh, the Apollo 11 50th anniversary. How many of you have come to other events here at Griffith Observatory related to our Apollo 50th anniversary? How many of you came to more than three? How many came to more than six? Oh, we got a couple. How many? All but three. That's pretty good. That would be 13. I think you might be the winner. Anyone come to more than 13? <laughs> All right. You are the grand prize winner. And uh, so maybe next time I see you, I'll give you an out-of-date calendar. <laughs> that'll, be, that'll be great. 1969. From 1969. That's right. We should find out what year that is and was. And then you can relive it again because we haven't relived it enough. Anyway, let me uh, begin by introducing myself. I'm Laura Danley. I'm the curator of Griffith Observatory. And along with Dr. David Reitzel, Patrick So, Tony Cook, we are your All Space Considered team. We're here the first Friday of every month to do the latest and greatest updates in astronomy and space science. This past, uh, boy, almost two weeks now, um, we've been devoted entirely to celebrating Apollo 11. And this tonight, our last uh, event is Apollo, All Space Considered, that's the name of our program, remembers remembering Apollo 11 because that's what we did all the, for the last two weeks. So let me say a few quick housekeeping things before we get started. One is that if you need to leave, you want to go out the back doors. That's a closet. That's an emergency exit. If there were to be an emergency, we would lead you out that way. But, um, but if you need to just go out, go out the back because you won't, you won't succeed if you try to go out those sides. Um, and then also, you can leave your cell phone on, but there's no reception in this room. And so your phone will be roaming, looking for signal, it'll run out of battery, and then you won't be able to call your ride share, and you'll be stranded, and the wolves will get, well, I guess coyotes. And um, you'll be on the news uh, tomorrow morning for having spent the night in Griffith Park. So you don't want any of that to happen. So uh, put your phone on, on uh, either turn it off or, or airplane mode or something so it doesn't waste the battery searching put it in for certain. All space mode. All space mode. <laughs> I like that. We're going to have to get that. All right. Uh, so um, lastly, how many of you are members of Friends of the Observatory? Thank you, members of Friends of the Observatory. You're going to wish you were a member of Friends of the Observatory, and we're going to make you want to be a, a member, uh, because we had some pretty great Friends of the Observatory events this past couple of weeks. Friends of the Observatory is Griffith Observatory's partner support organization. Um, membership and uh, fundraising organization that supports so much of what we do, especially our fifth grade field trip program. So if, if you like 10-year-olds, or even if you don't like 10-year-olds, but you think that you want them to be educated when they grow up, you want them to come to Griffith Observatory uh, on a field trip, and you can help support that by supporting Friends of the Observatory. And then how many of you are tax-paying citizens of the city of Los Angeles? I always like asking that one because Griffith Observatory is owned and operated by the city of Los Angeles Department of Recreation and Parks. So we're a city park, a very special city park, uh, with an amazing facility, and we are here to be your observatory. You don't have to build your own observatory. We are your observatory. You just come up the hill and look through telescopes, and that's uh, why we're here. All right. With that, uh, let's move forward and um, just uh, look back for a moment at this iconic image that reminds us of the extraordinary events of 50 years ago, the first time man, human, set foot on the moon. So the first question we like to ask is, where were you? Does everybody remember? Oh, that's a shaking head because I can tell you're not even old enough. You weren't <laughs> born yet. I recognize that look. Um, you're not the only one. We asked uh, our social media and had uh, scores of responses. And some of them were, well, most of them. I was in front of television when humans first stepped on the moon. I was with my parents watching TV, and then I wasn't born yet. So there are the others. Um, 
folks were very specific about the fact that it was a black and white TV. We had several on the black and white TV. And in particular, it was a Zenith black and white TV. You'd be surprised the number of people that recalled it was a Zenith <laughs> black and white TV. Uh, and uh, I love the one that says, I was two years old, it was my first memory. I think Luna's got quite the remarkable memory. Good for, good for Luna. I wonder if that Picard's a real last name. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> and if it's a cat. I don't know. <laughs> um, and then there were a couple out of the country, which I like this one, uh, who was in the Netherlands and said that he was in a black and white TV in a two-family farmhouse and everyone gathered to watch silently. I was the only American and so proud. Uh, and then I like the one that said we didn't have TV in South Africa, so we just had to look on the newspaper. How many of you, is there anyone in here that has a particularly uh, remarkable story beyond I was at home with my parents watching black and white TV? Any unusual locations, anything anyone wants to share? How many of you were in front of TV with your families? Yeah. And of the rest of you weren't born yet. Yeah, that's kind of that's that, that kind of falls into those two main categories. So, uh, so indeed, we had a big celebration here at Griffith Observatory that started not on the 16th, the day of the launch, but on the 13th, because we had a big star party, and that was our kickoff for the uh, events of our Golden Moon celebration. So David, do you want to tell us a little bit about what we were doing on the lawn and sure, some of the we activities? Were, we were getting roasty and warm as things were, of course, but we were kicking off the activities with a, a exhibit we call Stations of Apollo. And what that looked like was this. Um, our spacecraft there's in the middle. When we kicked it off, we launched it from Earth and headed it towards the moon. Um, that's the moon there, and then of course, Above our heads in this picture is actually an Earth. It was a three and a half foot Earth and a 10 inch moon, and they were placed 105 feet apart. And that's the right distance for that scale model. So if you were out in space and got far enough away from the Earth moon system, those, those models on our front lawn are what it would actually look like to look at those two. That's how big they are relative to one another and how far apart they are. Then we built a spacecraft that you see in this image in the middle that is not to scale. It's a <laughs> just a little too big. Um, and get a close-up of it there, the command module and the lunar module. And you can see how on the day of the landing, we brought them all the way to the moon and landed there. Each day, we moved it the appropriate distance. Now the spacecraft fought back a little bit. We had some technical difficulties. So you're up here visiting and notice that's not where it was supposed to be. Well, in 10 years, we'll have that thing really nailed down. <laughs> before the right. end of the next before decade, the the next we'll decade, get that we'll go to the moon. And <laughs> <laughs> Why does Rice play Texas? Um, another thing we did was we made our own craters. And this is an activity that I haven't told the boss yet, but I'm hoping we get to continue maybe they had star parties or something like that because it was wildly successful. You can see a few of our museum guides there in our lab coats. Well, what do you do is you take a layer of flour, you put some colored cornstarch on the top of it, and you let kids roll marbles or steel ball, ball bearings or wood ball bearings, things of different mass, down into it, and you make craters down in there, Two, as you can see. One. Oh, okay. Right. So check so, this out. Neither of the balls had enough velocity or mass to push themselves down underneath the surface, but this one had a lot more ejection come out, didn't it? So this is what we see when we see on the moon. A lot of times, when you look at the moon, you'll see one crater that has a ton of uh, a ton of these lines just coming out from it right there, and uh, yeah, it's really obvious. However, on the parts of the moon where it's really light or it's really white, it's hard to see, especially on the far side of the moon. And these, these, uh, these impact particles, these, these uh, ejections, they're all kind of blending in with one another. Well, not only do we have special Apollo uh, exhibits today because of... So anyway, we're going to talk more about that. I don't want to ruin that for you. But Fred, that's one of our museum guys, guides, Fred Quinlan, was doing a great job explaining that. And indeed, the different colored layers of cornstarch acts as the ejecta. So you can see the yellow gets ejected out and forms those rays, much like you do on an actual crater on the moon. The ridges get elevated upwards, just like a real crater on the moon. So um, this was a, a very popular exhibit, really fun with kids. It did dye our museum guide's hands blue, so they made a major sacrifice for that. Um, <laughs> We Whoa. did not we recreate did, the we rills. We did not recreate the rills. Yeah, those are probably collapsed lava tubes, most likely. And that's, we didn't have any hot lava in there. It was safe for kids. <laughs> um, there's our, our three foot uh, Earth with a beautiful moon up above. And the real can, moon. The real moon. And what's interesting is that they look kind of to scale there, actually, <laughs> which is kind of fun. Um, but a beautiful evening sunset picture there with the golden light. And another shot of our Earth and the moon with the folks out on the lawn getting ready for the start party. So.
And if you haven't been to a star party, uh, we do that in collaboration with the Los Angeles Astronomical Society, the Sidewalk Astronomers, and the Planetary Society. All of these volunteers bring up their own telescopes, and there can be 20, 25, 30 telescopes on the lawn. It's lots of fun. Everybody's looking at different things. Uh, so we encourage you to come back for a star party sometime. So indeed, the sun set, and oh, that's the button we want. Uh, the evening began to uh, uh, creep in, and we, that evening and that afternoon, showed two showings of the Apollo 11 movie, the CNN Films movie. How many people in here saw this film? And for those of you who saw it, what would you tell everybody else who hasn't seen it? See it, right? It's still playing, I think, at the uh, California Science Center. We're, we don't have any more showings of it, but it is Beautiful, yeah. really gorgeous. I've learned you can rent it on Amazon if you have Amazon Prime. There may be other outlets you can do it, but um, go see it in a theater if you. Yeah, can. you want a big screen. Big screen big you sound. want to be overwhelmed by it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You know, I just wanted to say to me the best thing about it was there's virtually no contemporary narration. That's right. It's just almost all raw footage from 50 years. Ago. In fact, it's all raw. There is no narration. You're exactly right. So you just live the footage. And what's remarkable about this film is that that footage was taken during the Apollo missions with the intention of making a large format major motion picture with MGM. And MGM pulled out and all that footage just went into an archive and was lost for 45 years. Nobody knew it was there. The filmmaker Ken uh, Miller, uh, Todd Miller, um, said in an interview that uh, he had gone, talked to the archivist, and he said, normally archivists are rather staid, kind of low-key sorts of personalities. And he got this email with 10 exclamation points and bold letters, and oh my gosh, look what we found. And they found, oh, I think about 150 film canisters of original large format film never seen before. So I'm, I'm not really a sales rep for this movie, <laughs> but I, I got to say I saw it three times and I was just, uh, just um, thrilled by it each time. So I, I do highly recommend it. Anyway, that night uh, we showed Good that a couple of times. Here, oh. Just a comment to add on to what he said. Having grown up at that time, um, I saw the movie and it is awesome. It brings it all back because we had the black and white set. We had Walter Cronkite and Wally Chara, but we had mostly just that radio chatter. It had us on the edge of our seats because that was the authoritative connection to the Apollo crew and everyone else. And just listening to it, we were involved in that voice. And that movie is loaded with that. So it, it evokes it perfectly. And I can't recommend the movie enough. Ned just had the, uh, also I, I had similar experience and seeing that was like, well, you know, it's going to happen, but it's like, getting uh, in contact with time travelers who will give you the best view of that event and <laughs> unbelievable views of it. So. so that was our kickoff on Saturday the 13th and then the next Monday we were busy creating the exhibits that are in the depths of space and David you want to talk about this? There's our crew. Yeah. Things in boxes. Things in boxes, acrylic display cases we had to order. Um, friends of the observatory let us borrow some tablecloths, beautiful tablecloths, brand new lights from shops we set up. But in any case, I'd like to thank Tony actually for all the hard work he put in on our models. Um, he is primarily responsible for all the models there. Um, one of our museum guides, John Palmer, who is in the audience I believe tonight, John, thank you, um, was responsible for helping us get those wonderful helmets. We had a helmet signed by Michael Collins who was in the command module orbiting up there for Apollo 11. His signature even drew a little command module. Um, the other helmet was signed by Dave Scott, the seventh man on the moon, the first man on the moon to drive a car. So that's pretty cool. Um, so anyway, all those displays down there, it was a pleasure to put them together. They're still there. Tonight is the last night you can see them. So if you haven't seen them yet, I recommend you go take a look. Um, there is an Apollo Lunar Lander video game back from 1979, I believe it was, Atari. Used to be able to play it in the arcades with a quarter. Um, we had it there for kids to play for free. In fact, today I heard a big cheer go up in the depths of space. I was wondering, what's going on? And then I remembered Lunar Lander. I went and looked, sure enough, a kid had landed on the moon. He was so happy. Is he the only one of the whole two weeks. Oh no, I've heard lots of cheering oh, and things, but it was just, this was a big cheer. Maybe he'd been trying over and over, I don't know. Um, this wonderful, uh, on the left is the Saturn V model, that big tall one that's down there that Tony put together for us. And then that wonderful, uh, it's a replica spacesuit 
that comes from a local uh, costume company. I think we can say who it is. It's Global <laughs> Effects. And they supply the costumes for many of the major motion pictures. Things like uh, Apollo 18. That was a not so realistic movie about Apollo, but there was all sorts of equipment in there that was realistic Apollo looking equipment. The spacesuit is just wonderful. You can go get your picture taken with it um, down there. Uh, anyway, um, there was, uh, yeah, yeah. And, well, the last thing in the depths of space down there was this Apollo in real time. And you can still go to this web page now. It was some folks that working with NASA got together all the audio picture, all the audio pictures, all the audio recordings, all the transmissions, all the photographs, all the television broadcasts. They put it together into one package. You click now, and it just starts running the program from launch, and then 195 hours or whatever later, you get splashdown. And every transmission is there, every image is there. It is simply wonderful. And we ran that on the screen in the depths of space. And we had all that radio chatter for our visitors to the, enjoy. The very chatter you were talking about. Yeah. Has anybody in this audience gone to this website? It, it's, it's, it really brought it home. I, I was really, uh, first time I heard it. And then you can click, oh, I want to hear the medical guys. Oh, I want to hear the Capcom. Oh, I want to hear what's being said on the navigation side. And you can listen to all of the chatter through the entire mission. Really, really fun. And what's the surgeon hearing? Yeah, it's, right. His heart rate is, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so on um, the 20th, we're skipping ahead a little bit, but this is uh, real time of Apollo in real time on the 20th at about 3 or uh, 2, 2.18 local time, 1.18 local time. No, that was the landing. Yeah, that's where we're headed. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, so this is a video taken in real time of people in the depths of space listening to that. So that was real time 50 years later. Um, so uh, in addition to all the displays and, and family activities, we also had a number of talks and presentations in here. We're going to summarize a couple of them. Uh, Jeff McKibben, who works on All Space Considered, if you've come here before, he does a lot of our graphics, made me this stunning necklace of the posters from each of the talks. That's Jeff on the right on the, on, uh, in the picture on the left. And uh, so it's, these were all, just some actually, of our presentation um, thumbnails that went with every program. So of course, uh, we began the week on the launch day with our companion pr program to this one, our, our front end bookend, which was just simply All Space Considered Remembers Apollo 11. And it was us, because it always is us. And we're going to tell you a little bit about some of the highlights, because we summarize them uh, later. Um, but we will, before doing that, uh, we want to talk about two other panels that were really uh, quite wonderful. The first was From California to the Moon. This was on the uh, Wednesday of the program. And you may notice a little, little editing that we did of the image there. Um, and the idea is, and you may not realize, just what an extraordinary contribution to the uh, Apollo uh, missions and the uh, moon landing came right here in Southern California. We had a wonderful panel, and uh, on our right there, on the right in this picture, is a fellow named Chris Butler. He's an astronomical lecturer, uh, pardon me, astronomical artist here at Griffith Observatory. His father worked on the command module, and he talks a little bit about this. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, my father did work on the command service module here in Southern California. This is Apollo Central. This program, while all parts of the United States did participate, Southern California in particular was really involved. In fact, may I ask, how many in the audience have relatives or have, have a personal connection to people who worked on Apollo? Yeah, oh, no. number. And any? that's not unusual. Not unusual in it, Southern yeah. California. When, when I was little, I thought it would be unusual. I was sure that my dad was the only guy who worked on the Apollo <laughs> program. You know how that is with kids, right? And then I'd go to school and say, yeah, my dad worked on Apollo. Well, my dad worked on Apollo. My mom worked on Apollo. Everybody worked on Apollo. There were you know, all these thousands of people. There were probably well over 100,000 people in Southern California working on the Apollo program. And uh, he showed this graphic. Everything in orange was built here in Southern California. 
So that's most of the, <laughs> that's a lot of the whole uh, hardware and mission in orange there. And you can see North American, Douglas, IBM, TRW, uh, Grumman, uh, Lockheed, Rocketdyne, Boeing, et cetera. So uh, the majority of the hardware was built here in Southern California. It looks like all the rockets were. So where do you go with a rocket without the actual, you know, the thing that the engines. Yeah. Uh, so here, of course, recognizable map of our town. And here are the locations of all the businesses involved in Apollo. So yes, if you grew up here, you probably knew someone uh, who worked on Apollo. And somebody's family member or relative, friend, uh, it was pervasive. So well, I'll come back to that on was it a hoax? You know, I mean, it would be hard. We're in Apollo Central here, so it'd be hard to fool all those people. But we'll come back to that. Um, the, the, for me, highlight of the uh, uh, From California to the Moon panel were the two gentlemen next to me. Next to me, Jerry Elverum, and next to him, Don Harvey, both of whom were engineers who worked for TRW <laughs> and developed the descent engine that landed uh, the lunar module on the moon. Now, most, most of the time when you have a rocket, you turn it on, you get a certain amount of thrust, or you turn it off. But they needed to have a throttling rocket, one that they could have turn up, turn back, and also a gimbling one, one that could turn so they could steer. So this flexibility in a rocket was not something that had ever been done before. And I have a couple of clips of Jerry Elverum speaking about this. And it will be true that there, he's going to use some vocabulary words you've never heard of. I was sitting up here thinking, oh gosh, how am I going to explain this? I don't even, I've never heard that word before. So if you don't understand what he's saying, it doesn't matter because the real story here is the individual and his enthusiasm for the program. So here he's talking about the challenge. You want to have absolute control of what the flow rate's going into your device is. Because if you can't control that, it, if you let it control the flow rate, you could go any place. Since it's a cavitating venturi, which Don will talk about, there's no reason we can't throttle that with a pinto into the throat of the cavitating venturi. Right, right? There's no reason you can't throttle it with a pinto in the throat of the cavitating venturi. That's what I thought. So, uh, so how did he solve that problem? Let me show you that little 500 pound thrust engine. So it has a we scaled down version, 500 SDL pounds. When Kennedy made his statement about going to the moon. And this engine here, the Pinto, you can see right there, there is the injector in the center of that engine. And here's a tip of it that's closed off and the oxidizer sprays out here, but it has a Pinto that goes into the throat and so it is closing the fuel and oxidizer down in flow rate. And that is now throttling this engine. And the two of them are tied together with a very simple mechanical sleeve. So for every position of this sleeve, there is a flow rate determined absolutely back here. This was a brand new innovation. You designed it? I designed it, yeah. and it was because they came from JPL at the right time. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but, is that top secret? Are we all going to get arrested? Yeah, no, it's not top secret. And here's something that we didn't say in that, and I wish I had. Uh, his design is still being used today. Yeah. It's one of the few pieces SpaceX of SpaceX makes great use of it, yeah. Yeah, so <laughs> that invention, and he said the uh, patent wore, af wore off after 16 years. So, so I asked him, <laughs> is the money still pouring in? He said no. But, but indeed, SpaceX uses that design on their throttling rockets. So how do you like that? And then he tells that the last clip here is a story that he had 10 days. It was uh, about to, uh, they, they needed to scale up from the little 500 uh, pound model to flight scale hardware. And he suddenly learned he had 10 days. So here's a little bit of a, a, a testament to, to um, the people who helped make it happen and to the culture and the times that made this possible. Then NASA came in and said, when you scale the chamber up to the exact, up to the 17 inches of the Apollo 
design size engine, it's going to go unstable. And I had about 10 days to answer that question. And we, we put together what we called the lunar module 17 inch iron chamber here. And as soon as we put it on the test stand, everybody started calling it the iron pig because it looked like a big pig with a curly tail on the end of it. Grumman and NASA said, we're coming out and we're going to attend that very first firing. Oof. And now I'm sitting there with no, no time to check it out. I got to fire it in front of the customer for the very first time. Um, and set off bombs in it to show that it was stable. And, and uh, did you ever get home, or did you work <laughs> 10 days straight? No, I, I get home once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> Were you already married at that point? Oh, yes, and then my I, wife I think Jean is sitting. <laughs> we need to give there. her a round of applause. And she put up with it. And of course, the kids put up with it, because in those days, People worked, and they weren't home to, to see their family as much. And when Apollo came along, and it was right after World War II psychology, you worked because the nation needed it done. And there was no way we were going to not get to the moon by the end of the decade. I love that. You have to have that kind of dedication. No way we're not going to do this. And they did. They got it done. You have a comment up there. Oh, yes. The one part that I really liked was in the, towards the beginning when he said about when Kennedy said, we are going to the moon, it's like, we don't have anything ready. <laughs> and the timeline that was so limited or rushed in order to get this program off the ground. Yeah. So if it's still on YouTube, I really recommend Oh, it the is. Program. All of these presentations are on YouTube, and I strongly recommend it, too. I mean, it's, it, it, you see the nature of it, but my goodness, living history and wonderful storytelling. Um, OK, then the next night, Tony hosted a panel called The Once and Future Moon. And do you want to tell us a little bit about it? What yeah, were some of the big so, takeaways? Uh, having grown up watching Apollo, I was wondering what happened? You know, we, we thought we'd go on and build cities and stuff. So I thought I'd get together some experts who have also done a lot of thinking about it. I had uh, on going from uh, left to right for me is uh, Warren James, who's the host of the Hour 25 show, if you might remember long ago, a science fiction show on the, on the radio and now a podcast. He also hosts a science fiction show at the uh, Pasadena Public Library once a month. It's really nice. Uh, in the middle of, of the guests there is David Livingston, who is the host of the uh, Space Show, which is a three times a week podcast or live, live uh, internet streaming show, uh, interviewing experts on, on space development with an emphasis on commercial development. And then Rod Pyle, who we've seen before, and he, was he in the panels we've shown? I can't remember Yes, now. he was. Yeah, okay. And Rod is also an author, and uh, he's also on the podcast, Cool, cool Space News, associated with KFI. Um, anyway, so uh, in this first part, uh, we were talking, well, we talked about the science fiction history of the moon, and and uh, how mythology, from mythological origins to science fiction, people have long dream, dreamt of going to the moon. But then we uh, talked about you know achieving the moon uh, from World War II developments and finally uh, getting to the moon. And Rod uh, reminded us, uh, Rod told us a story of interviewing Buzz Aldrin's son, who was 13 at the time of the landing, and what his son was worried about. It's so like I talked to her about an hour and a half. This is Bud, Buzz Aldrin's son. And so when the interview was over, usually when you interview, I interviewed, I don't know, 30, 40 people in the last year for a couple of books. So at the end of the interview, I said, is there anything you want to add? And usually people say, yeah, that's about it. It's been an hour and a half, let me go. You know? And he said, uh, yeah, if you don't mind, I'd like to tell you something I never told a writer before. Yeah, please. That's what we live for. He said, when my dad was walking on the moon, 
I saw the way he was jumping around, and I know a lot of people were wondering why he was doing that bunny hop thing, and I knew exactly why he was doing it, because he's an intensely scientific guy, and he wanted to see when he landed where his center of mass would go, and he wanted to watch the, the little bits of dirt travel away from his boots in an arc in the low gravity with no atmosphere, which is what Buzz said later he was doing. He also said, but I wasn't worried about my dad because I knew the spacesuit wouldn't rip because NASA was the very best. And I knew the lunar module wasn't gonna strand them because NASA tested everything. He said, what worried me the most was looking at that wire that went from the lunar module to the antenna dish that was pointed <laughs> at Earth. It was kind of coiled up, it wasn't lying flat on the lunar surface. And he said, I was scared to death my dad was gonna trip over that and embarrass me in front of my friends at school. <laughs> I thought, you know, 11 year old year old boys are the same everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then we went on to talk about uh, current plans for exploring the moon and and you know what what we look forward to in the future. And I have to say, you know, the way ideas are rolled out with we're going back to the moon, you know, in the next few years and this and that doesn't seem to inspire a lot of excitement just from hearing that. And one moment of excitement that did happen, though, is when uh, Warren, when I asked people to talk about, uh, you know, why why do we need to even go back to the moon? And Warren James came out with something. Now I have to say, not everybody agrees with the exact way he framed it, but in general, it seemed that people liked his response. And here it is. Okay. Yeah, so sure. why go back to the moon? We go back to the moon to save our lives. We go back to the moon to do things to do the things that will solve the critical problems that we are facing in the next 25 to 50 years. Then we also go back to the moon because this opens the door to solving the problems that threaten to end, at a minimum, human civilization by the end of the century, if not the human race and most of the life on Earth entirely. And I also will say he's also an aerospace engineer. I forgot to mention that in, in uh, How many of you think that rationale makes sense, that if we go back to the moon, we can solve problems here? And how many of you think that sounds unreasonable and not believable? Yeah, it's a very interesting debate, and uh, so they debated it. <laughs> yeah. And then finally, uh, you asked... Oh, yes. Um, wh what would it be like on the moon 50 years from now? What, what do people th picture going on then? And again, Warren uh, kind of repeated what the other people were saying, but maybe a little more forcefully, I think. Oh, I think the, the moon will be not the home of light industry. It will be the home of heavy industry. I, I think it will be a large and thriving commercial entity with mining of the moon for various reasons, building solar-powered satellites, producing materials for going out into deep space. It will, it will be a thriving area with multiple large cities, multiple large business enterprises. Um, you could have a population of several million people on the moon and in other regions in cislunar space. Um, and I think it will be supporting large industrial activities there and beyond. And that we will see at that point a large amount of industrial activity in the asteroids, in near-Earth asteroids, maybe the main belt, but I think mostly the near-Earth asteroids. The one thing I cannot tell you is what language will those people be speaking? Will it be predominantly English or will it be predominantly Chinese? Chinese. And we can't answer that question. <laughs> And part of the reason uh, he gave that response is right now China, as we speak, is exploring the moon with a robot on the far side with a complete <coughs> communication system that's able to broadcast live images from, or live data from the far side of the moon. And they're looking for resources. So, uh, carrying on, that, that was Thursday night. Friday night, we had a party. <laughs> we showed, again, the Apollo 11 movie, and we had a beautiful rooftop party uh, with friends of the observatory. There's Katie, our wonderful media producer, looking <laughs> at the moonrise. And uh, after watching the movie and drinking a couple glasses of wine and watching the moonrise and looking through a telescope, 
It was really a magical night. Was there anyone who was there? Yeah, it was kind of gorgeous, wasn't it? Yeah, beautiful evening, and we hope to do more such things in the future. So then that brings us up to the 20th, the actual day, and I don't know what was wrong with me the day I decided to do five talks that day, um, <laughs> but we did. And uh, so the first was a look back at Apollo 11. It was a, a shortened version, and Patrick in particular uh, joined me for that, dressed as an Apollo engineer. We didn't say it was a cosplay, but, uh, but he came ready for the task. So uh, Patrick did a wonderful job summarizing the Apollo 11 mission. We're not going to go through the entire mission here because, you know, we've done that and it's on, online. Um, but we are going to talk about the, uh, the key moment on the 20th. Uh, when Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, uh, reached the surface, Michael Collins, as you mentioned, orbiting uh, in the command module overhead. We had one of our staff make this lovely diagram uh, from Google Earth where you left the uh, Kennedy Space Center launch complex and hit the Sea of Tranquility with just about four days and six hours, 45 minutes travel. Uh, so that's not really what Google Earth comes up with, but we liked it anyway. Uh, so, Patrick, tell us about that approach and the landing on the right. moon. So, you know, we, we're going to relive this moment again. Uh, uh, so this is July 20th, and this was the view from the lunar module, uh, looking down um, at the lunar surface. Mm -hmm. And in particular, we can actually see with these uh, labels here, um, the landing site in the Sea of Tranquility, and um, some other features. Uh, this is uh, US Highway 1, this little rill here. And, the re and Sign Winder and Diamondback and Boot Hill. And these were features that the astronauts uh, in particular needed to know as they descended to the moon. So they needed to know all of this like the back of their hand. So um, uh, there was a uh, call from um, uh, Mission Control saying, we'll go for power descent. And that was uh, the, the signal for the actual descent to the moon. And uh, this is how it happened. While the command service module orbited 60 miles uh, above the lunar module, and Michael Collins was the only person in, in there, the two astronauts inside the lunar module would descend to a point of uh, 50,000 feet, which is uh, just a little bit higher than uh, an airliner would fly, and uh, go for a PDI, which is a power descent I initiation. And the whole process from 50,000 feet to the touchdown would take about 12 minutes. And it was all computer controlled. Uh, the, the astronauts didn't have any hand in it. And the, the programs that ran these uh, phases, like the braking phase was uh, P63, and when they reached about 7,500 feet, the lunar module would uh, pitch over from looking, with the windows looking at the blackness of space, to almost forward so that uh, this, uh, the astronauts could actually see uh, the lunar surface. And this was the approach. and. Uh, and uh, looking for a landing spot. And that was called high gate. And when they reached low gate, uh, having s uh, the landing spot already sp uh, spotted, they were actually um, you know, going towards a landing. And at this point, the astronauts actually had an option of um, taking the uh, computer out of uh, autopilot and actually guiding the spacecraft down to uh, touchdown. In the next uh, slide, we'll show you a little bit about the uh, Apollo guidance computer. This was uh, a computer that controlled the whole descent. It's about the size of a carry-on suitcase, a little bit bigger, weighs about 70 uh, pounds. And um, it had, uh, by today's standards, not a lot of capacity. You can see that uh, 32, 36K of read-only memory, which contained all these programs for descent. And these were let literally uh, ones and zeros uh, woven into wires that were inside the computer. So and that's K, not K, Meg, right, K. Right, and we don't even talk about Megs. Uh, oh, yeah. We talk about uh, gigabytes and even terabytes, so a million to a hundred million fold the capacity of uh, the computer back then. Now, this was the most advanced computer at the time, and it did the job, and it had to calculate from the landing radar the altitude, the attitude, the orientation in space of the, of the lunar module and its velocity, and then modulate how much uh, thrust was needed uh, to uh, attain that glide path down to the, uh, to the ground. It also had a, a display and a keyboard attached to it so the astronaut can interact on it. 
Now, during the uh, uh, flight down, um, uh, the computer was working 90% of its capacity. And uh, there was those famous alarms that came on uh, that were announced, uh, the 1202 and 1201. But if the computer was working at 90% of capacity, why would those alarms happen? Well, today we know, actually, actually at the time, Mission Control had no idea. Um, uh, Neil Armstrong called in the first alarm, and, uh, and they had no idea. They had seconds to decide. The computer was actually overloaded because a rendezvous radar was uh, actually switched in the wrong mode and uh, took, the, uh, took about 13% and actually up to 20% of the computer processing uh, capacity in, on top of that 90%. So the computer literally shut down and restarted again, and it did that five times. And, um, so with just minutes to go, they're about to land on the moon. We're going to play the video. You'll hear right. it. And they had split-second decisions to say go or no go on that. But the recovery programs actually uh, took hold and were able to uh, 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 continue where they left off. So at a certain way, waypoint where the lunar module was, it, it knew its, its all its uh, attributes at that time. It would pick up from the last waypoint and then take the most recent data and pick up from where it was uh, left up. And now that you, was you told me told us before that when they uh, first called in and said we've got this 1202 alarm, nobody quite knew what to do. So what did, what happened? Yeah. So what happened was that um, it was uh, flight director went to Steve Bales, who was the guidance officer. You know, at, and actually, actually, someone said 12 when they, when they heard 1202, someone said, "What's that?" And uh, so Steve Bells had to go to uh, communicate with uh, a um, MIT software engineer in the back room who happened to, happen, happen to have a written list of all the error codes and said, oh, yeah, 1202, that's an executive overflow. And no one what meant, you know, knew what that meant, but uh, it meant that the computer was being mm -hmm. overloaded. And it says, as long as, as, long as the, uh, the, the, the radar is working and, and, um, and, and the lunar module is uh, is still on on its flight path down to the moon. Um, uh, that's a go, and then that got called up to uh, Steve Bales, and then through the flight director, through the Capcom, and said, "Well, go on that alarm." And the astronaut said, "Okay, we'll continue." <laughs> so, so they didn't press that button, right? They did not press that button. If that was a no go, th this is the this is the flight deck of the lunar module. So you can see this abort stage. They would have pressed that button, and the moon landing would have been aborted and it would be, the whole mission would be basically over. Did Apollo 12 through 17 have any 1202s or 1201? Uh, no, the they, they figured it out by that time. Yeah, they bare had. So. <laughs> <laughs> so at the same time, out the window. Right, so, so in this image here, and by the way, um, Buzz Aldrin doesn't have an extra arm, because this, this is a whole, um, <laughs> this is a composite picture taken at different times. Uh, Buzz Aldrin set up a camera, a 16 millimeter camera, uh, to actually uh, film the descent to the moon. Um, when it was broadcast live, all we heard were the transmissions from the, astro um, the astro astronauts. So um, apart from the two astronauts actually visually witnessing the descent down, this was the only um, uh, film that we have of uh, what it would look like as uh, the lunar module um, to send it down to the moon. So it's film, it was developed later, but we're, we're, we placed it in this next video side by side with a CBS simulation. You also want to, maybe I'll just mention, so, so as they're coming over, you'll see, uh, you'll hear Neil Armstrong take over because where they were going to land was a boulder field and a crater. So if they had left it to the computer, they would have, landed in a, in a very dangerous spot, possibly tipped over the lander. Yeah. And uh, so you'll hear the 1202, you'll hear Neil describing that mm -hmm. he needs to uh, not land where the computer is going to land, he's gonna take it over. And you'll see the CBS, <clears throat> pardon me, CBS simulation, which lands early, many, many, many seconds early because the simulation didn't agree with reality because- They were going by the mission, yep. actual mission timeline. And so. in the zeroth hour, Neil had to had to make a zeroth hour uh, change. So they mentioned also you'll you'll hear them call out like sixty seconds, thirty seconds. And that's how much fuel they have left. So that's mission control. That's 
saying nothing but their fuel rates. And they'll also call <laughs> out 5% fuel. So that on their gauge, when it reached 5%, there was a red line below that. They didn't know how much more fuel there was, maybe 20 seconds, 40 seconds, 60 seconds So listen seconds of for fuel. all of those things. Houston, you're looking at our Delta uh, That's the primary. Book alarm. Looking good to us. Over. The 1202. 1202. Good radar data. Altitude now 33,500 feet. Good. Roger, we got you. We're going at alarm. Just trying to figure out. This is like 20, 20 seconds later. Roger, copy. Altitude 4200. You're a go for landing. Over. Oh, great go. I got it then. Go for landing. 3,000 feet. Shot the alarm. 3,000 feet. Ooh. Go to alarm. meaning they're on the spot. Roger. 1201 alarm. That's Walter Cronkite's voice. Where go? Same time. Where go? 2,000 feet. 2,000 feet. Into the egg. 47 degrees. Roger. Oh, the data is coming in beautifully. 100 feet down at 19. So you saw how much longer they went than they were supposed to, and with the fuel dropping, Jerry Elverum, the engineer who was here, who, whose engine was the one landing them on the moon, said he was in the back room going, put it down, put it down, and like yelling at the screen to have them put down because he did not know how much longer they had before they ran out of fuel. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. So. I mean, every time I watch that, my, even my heart pounds. <laughs> In fact, the flight surgeon, uh, when when uh, Armstrong took control, uh, his heart rate, um, Armstrong's heart rate was measured to be about 77 um, uh, beats per minute. By the time he landed the lunar module on the ground, it was 156. I guess. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> um, this is just the landing profile, and this is what it looked like uh, every second as the lunar mo module descended to the moon. And uh, they actually landed uh, four miles uh, off course and a little, uh, about a mile cr uh, cross uh, range. But you know they had to l avoid that uh, big crater with all the uh, boulders. So of course then came the great historic moment that everyone knows. Um, uh, at the foot of the ladder, the lamp foot beds are only uh, uh, depressed in the surface about uh, one or two inches, uh, although the surface appears to be uh, very, very fine-grained as you get close to it. It's almost like a powder. Ground mass uh, is very fine. Uh, 
Yeah, now step off the land now. he gets off and he says, well, it appears to be very fine-grained, and I'm thinking, I'm on the moon! I mean, when you know? But no, he's ever the scientist and the engineer and the pilot, very precise. So, then Buzz came down? And yes, Buzz oh. came down. Okay, oh, oh, Buzz yeah. came well, okay, down. I thought you were Buzz. recalling it the way you did. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, Buzz, yes. Buzz uh, after Armstrong collected his first sample, which Took him a while because he got interested in taking pictures and had to be nagged to do to get that sample. Buzz was able to come down and uh, stepped on the surface, started setting up experiments and stuff. Now, Buzz, they had one camera that they handed back and forth. Buzz used it mainly to take pictures of the lunar module and got by accident a picture, the only Hasselblad picture of Neil Armstrong. Can you see him? The lower left corner, if you enlarge that part, that's the only picture that Buzz Aldrin took of Neil Armstrong on the surface. Most of the famous pictures with the astronaut in it are pictures of Buzz Aldrin taken by Neil Armstrong. So. Now they had work to do in <laughs> yes. order to remember it. That's right. So um, th there were so many tasks. Uh, NASA made sure that uh, each astronaut had the whole, the kind of like a checklist of all the activities, all the things that they needed to do on the moon. And as mentioned earlier, they set up some uh, early uh, some scientific experiments. Uh, one of them was um, a, um, a device to measure solar wind. All it was was a big aluminum piece of foil and to capture pieces of the sun. And that was left uh, exposed to the sun for about 77 minutes. And then the, the foil was retrieved and then taken back to Earth for analysis. Uh, the two other experiments was on the, on the left there is a uh, seismometer used to uh, measure moonquakes. And um, they did get confirmation that it worked on the day of the landing because uh, once they turned the instrument on, uh, scientists back on Earth could actually hear the vibrations of the footprints of the astronauts as they, as they tromped across the moon. So it was really kind of great. And they even heard a movement from within the uh, lunar module. That's how sensitive this uh, seismometer was. On the right is a lunar reflector uh, designed to uh, reflect a powerful laser beam sent from an observatory from the Earth. Reflected off that uh, uh, mirrored, uh, it's actually a, a, an array of mirrors, and the light that's bounced back uh, to, to Earth is, um, the, if they can get the timing of it, uh, the round trip and just half of that timing, and they know the speed of light, they can cal calculate the actual um, Earth-Moon distance to within a few inches. And these reflectors uh, left by Apollo 11 and, and the other missions are still in use today. Then the flag was set up. Um, this was a flag that was purchased uh, in, in April 1969 from a Sears uh, nearby and spent about $3 on it. And that was after a long debate about whether or not there should be a flag or not. And, uh, Everybody thought, well, everybody kind of expects whenever you go to a new place, you're not claiming the territory. It's just to show your country behind you was there first. So anyway, so they set up the flag. And there was a rod in it to hold it out so it looked like it was not just limply hanging down. Um, so it looks like it's blowing in the wind, but really it's just held by a, a wire sticking out from the uh, pole. And then uh, we heard Buzz's son's story about Buzz jumping around the moon, so we had to show you that. All right, you do have to be uh, rather careful uh, to keep track of where your center of mass is. Time to take about two or three paces to uh, make sure that uh, you've got your feet underneath you. There's a lovely little uh, exchange between Michael Collins up in the command module and mission control. They're saying to, to Collins, well, you're probably the only person on Earth who can't watch this on TV. <laughs> because he had no way to watch it, of course. But 
but the rest of us did get to see those. And uh, if you're old enough to remember staying up late and uh, watching those grainy pictures come back, it was uh, quite something. So of course, uh, we uh, have this iconic picture again of Buzz on the moon. And uh, a few things were left behind. Yeah, among the many things, of course, uh, was the ceremonial uh, plaque, uh, which is at the base of the lunar uh, module. Um, so we've seen uh, this, and just to commemorate the first landing on the moon, signed by the three astronauts and um, then President Nixon. Um, also on the moon, uh, as an engineering test, um, this is uh, undisturbed lunar soil for billions of years. All of a sudden, in the next image, same area as the footprint left by Aldrin, just to see how far his, uh, his uh, lunar boot which actually can compress into the uh, lunar soil. But that, that print, footprint and the many uh, others left by Neil Armstrong and uh, Buzz Aldrin will remain like that for millions of years until the soft rain of micrometeorites will eventually wear it away. Or will it? Or will it? <laughs> yeah, maybe it was all just on a sound stage like this. Anyway, uh, this is one of the talks that, well, I didn't get to give on the big Saturday part, but I've given it many times for our other celebrations, and I'm going to hit the highlights here for you. Um, we built equipment. There were 400,000 people that worked on the Apollo program, so all of those people had to be in on the hoax because they all thought they were building hardware that would get us to the moon, and none of them said it wouldn't. All these folks in uh, mission control had displays, printouts, roll, th things giving them information. You had to fake all that information because all those displays have different bits of data to, to tell whether you're on your way to the moon, whether the stuff is working. All that had to be faked because all those people are seeing it throughout the entire mission. We launched these over and over again. So we actually built a giant rocket that did get launched. So that part it has to be fact because people just saw it with their eyes. The hardware behaved as it was expected to behave in space. After all, people got pictures of it. Those panels blow off, the command, the command module and service module come out, you have to pluck out the lamp. Well, they saw those panels being blown off in space, photographs of it. The Russians, or the Soviet Union at the time, had ships like these, the top one for Apollo 11, later Apollo missions, they had the more powerful one. They had to point those dishes at the spacecraft as it traveled to the moon. So all the transmissions that are supposedly faked, all the data that's faked, all had to be put on board a spaceship and flown to the moon <laughs> to convince the Russians that we were on our way there because they never said it wasn't happening. They picked it up as it was happening. Um, these pictures here, you had to truck all this gray dirt. You had to make massive sound stages. And it isn't just one or two pictures. There's whole archives full of these pictures with different backgrounds, different landscapes. We even brought a car with us. So kind of crazy. You had to pump all the air out of a huge sound stage and drive around a car in it. People want to know where are the stars, however. Well, we took some pictures at Griffith Observatory one night. I don't see any stars in that picture, and you're thinking this is Los Angeles, there are no stars. But in reality, <laughs> this was a cloudy night, and this was a short exposure, and the front lattice looks great. If we expose a little longer, the building is beautiful, but we don't see any domes. Go a little longer, now we can see our, our, our Celestat dome, our main planetarium dome, the cupola. We see some nice clouds. We're starting to lose details in the bright parts, though. We go even brighter. Now the bright parts of the, the image are completely overblown. You can't see those at all. They're overexposed. But there's a lot of detail along that top cupola. And even in the clouds, you see a couple of uh, spotlights that were shown up, probably down in Hollywood that we couldn't see before. So you expose long enough, you can see things like clouds, but this is not a good image of Griffith Observatory. So now let's do the moon for an example. You go to the moon and you start taking images. Well, this is now underexposed. We don't see the moon very well, nor the earth very well. We expose a little bit longer and we get a nice beautiful picture of the moon and the earth. If we expose longer still, okay, great, let's bring it on in, and we have stars, and we completely overexpose the surface of the moon and the Earth. So your choice is, you go to the moon, do you want to go take pictures of stars, or do you want this picture? This is the picture you want. You want to see the moon and the Earth. You don't care about stars. You can get those from Earth. The, picture, the, the ground shots, um, people comment that these shadows look like they're going different directions a little bit. That seems strange. There must have been multiple light sources. I took this picture on my way up to work one day. No, there were not multiple light sources. That's just the sun. This is called perspective 
figured out in the Renaissance. Um, another shot of the, the <laughs> shadows going different directions. Apparently, there's a little bit of relief going on here, too. There's some, some tilt due to the hill, and that actually sends shadows weird directions as well. So if you know what the landscape is and perspective, you can figure all that out. It's nothing weird. We brought back a lot of moon rocks on all the different missions. Those were distributed to scientists throughout the world, and no scientist said, this is actually an earth rock. I know where to get one in Kentucky. It just doesn't happen. In fact, these rocks have little micrometeorite impacts on them that you only get on the moon, little tiny grains of sand that make beautiful shooting stars in our atmosphere. There's no atmosphere on the moon to burn them up, so they reach the surface and they make little holes in all the rocks called micrometeorite impacts. There's also glass spheres that get made when you get impacts. Those erode away on Earth. They're all over the place on the moon and in moon rocks we have. Now, the, the landing sites were photographed by a NASA orbiter. Other countries have done it too. The NASA ones are the best pictures. All the landing sites, they're all six. We zoom in on one, you can see trails from where the astronauts were walking. And if you look up close, some of those trails are doubled. Those are tire tracks on the moon left by the rover during Apollo 17. This is an image of Apollo 17. Now, all of the where they went, it's all, it matches the ground photographs. You can go back and reproduce what we're seeing from orbit now with what happened then. A lot of folks want to know why haven't we gone back then? If you really went, you really had the hardware and could do it, why haven't we gone back? Well, it's a matter of national priority, really, and budget. This is the percentage of the federal budget that is in there. And as you can see, early on in the Apollo program, it peaks, you have a high budget, and then it drops down and gets below 1% throughout the entire shuttle region where we're doing the shuttle, building the International Space Station, and it's around half a percent now. So half of a penny out of every dollar goes to NASA. So when people want to know why we haven't gone back to the moon, that's why. <laughs> you can't do it on half a penny out of every dollar, tax dollar. Just we, we need to, if you want to go, you've got to fund it. But honestly, I believe we did go to the moon. It is just harder to fake it than it is just to go. <laughs> it, it just is. Uh, all the things you have to do to fake it. I mean, go to that real-time Apollo site. Every single transmission that's picked up is evidently faked. There's hundreds of hours of stuff that went on, all those photographs, all the hardware happening, all the communication. Why would you fake communication back and forth between the astronauts and mission control over problems you're having if you're trying to fake it? They faked problems? <laughs> they faked breaking off a, a piece on the ground? I guess we're going to talk about that later, when we, or like, when we aren't talking about that. They had to use a pen to get off the, the lunar surface. There's that whole story. Why would you fake that? That makes no sense. So anyway, I honestly believe we left this boot print on the moon. And, um, you know, it's, it's there to be seen if you were to go there, although terrible idea. We need to cordon that off and make it a, you know, yeah. a human treasury site. You don't site. want to put my footprint right next to I worry to that about one. that stuff. Yeah. You know, these, you see these crazy or, or terrible people that go Laura into was here. national parks <laughs> and they push over rocks that have been there for millions of years and break them and things. It's, I fear for this thing. Uh, also, you mentioned 400,000 people plus who worked on it. They're also ordinary people. Most of them were, you know, factory workers and, and all are not paid to be silent about what they were doing. Yeah. <laughs> There's no. no way you could keep that kind of secret among 400,000 people. Yeah. So just to quickly round out the rest of that day, we had two more panels about the future uh, and one about the mysteries of the moon. I thought it was kind of important to actually talk about the moon not as an object of exploration, but the moon, our body in the sky that's so beautiful. So we just had a quick description of the phases of the moon and why you see it's a big mystery if you don't know. And uh, so everyone in here looks like they've been through fifth grade, so I'm not going to go through the phases. Um, you might not know that the moon is spiraling away from us. And at the time that life formed on Earth, the moon was three times closer and three times uh, larger. At the time the moon was formed, it was 16 times larger in the sky, huge in the sky. So it's slowly spiraling away from us uh, due to tides and conservation of angular momentum. I won't go into it now, but it's kind of nice. I say, I feel like we're drifting apart, the Earth and moon. Um, another question is, where did the moon come from? We in our, uh, the, at this planet, Earth, has this remarkable moon that is a pretty massive compared to the, our home world. So the question is, where did it come from? 
And when I was growing up, there were thoughts, well, did it form when the Earth formed? Maybe it just was flung out of the Pacific Ocean. Does anybody remember that one? But in fact, we now uh, have a very good description that matches a lot of observables where the, Earth, the moon was formed in a giant <coughs> impact. This uh, Robin Kenop did this wonderful numerical model. You can see an object hit the Earth, kind of turned it into this glubby blob of hot stuff. That's, that's our Earth about uh, 4.4 million uh, billion years ago. And then as this material uh, spirals around, it forms a disk. So the Earth actually had rings for a very short while, maybe as short as even a year, maybe as long as about 100 years. But very quickly, there we go, this tidal stretched out more material into this disk. And then that material coalesced into the moon we see today. This is very uh, consistent with several observations with the rocks we bought, brought back from the moon that show that uh, our, our moon was molten at one time, fully molten, um, that it has, uh, has um, some chemical signatures that are just like Earth's, isotopic ratios they're called, and, and yet it's not exactly like Earth because the moon is far less dense than the Earth and has a very small core compared to the size of the, of the Earth, whereas the Earth has a very large core compared to the size of the planet. And the idea there is that the impacting object that is nicknamed Thea came in, you saw it kind of grazed off a bunch of stuff at the surface, the crust and mantle. The core of Thea sunk into the Earth and only crust and mantle, really most of what made up the moon was Earth's cr crust and mantle, not the metallic core, but the uh, rocky um, materials uh, in the mantle and crust of the Earth. So uh, it, there are a lot of other details, but it's, it is our best and, and pretty well agreed upon among scientists that that happened uh, not long after the Earth was formed and our moon was formed at that time. Another great mystery is why so many craters. Without going into a lot of detail, I'll just say that there is again a lot of agreement among the scientific community that there was a period uh, at about half a billion years after the um, uh, Earth was formed called the Late Heavy Bombardment. And I challenge you to go home and use that phrase with somebody in the next couple of days. Oh, you know, boy, I haven't thought about that since the late heavy bombardment. Something like that. I don't know. You can come up with your own. But the late heavy bombardment is this crazy moment in the dynamical history of our solar system when the outer planets were forming, all of the planets were forming together, and Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, the order that we know it now, was actually Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, and Uranus. That's right, Uranus was inside the order, um, orbit of Neptune. And then the models consistently show that there was a, an interaction between Jupiter and Saturn called a resonance, where they kind of tug in concert together, that flung Neptune out past Uranus. And when it went out much farther from the center of the solar system, passed by Uranus, it took all of the comets and stuff in the outer solar system and either flung them further out into the Oort cloud, an area of the solar system called the Oort cloud, or flung them inward. And, and the inner solar system was peppered with a rain of comets and completely uh, uh, bombarded the moon. And that's where we see all of the, uh, all of the craters formed, or a vast number of craters formed. So here's just a numerical model. You can see the time at the top going by in millions of years. And there's going to be a moment right here where all of those outer green fuzz small bits get scattered as Neptune goes flying out and thrown into the inner solar system. So if you've never heard of the late heavy bombardment, it's kind of cool, but that's why there are so many craters on the moon. And then the last mystery that we talked about was the search for water. To cut right to the punch, um, several missions uh, have seen evidence for water on the moon. We used to think the moon was bone dry, but we now believe that there could be water in permanently shadowed craters, especially at the South Pole and some at the North Pole. And this is essential because if we're ever going to go back to the moon and live and work or have this manufacturing concern that, that your, uh, mm -hmm. your panel was discussing, we're going to have to have water. 
it's essential for us, it's essential for rocket fuel, um, and it's a real uh, impetus for uh, future development of the moon. So we talked about the future, the next steps. How many of you have never heard of Artemis as a lunar program? It's okay, you can say you don't have. Okay, how many of you have heard of Artemis? I'm doing the teacher thing. Okay, good. Uh, Artemis is the new Apollo. We uh, just had the Apollo program 50 years ago. Artemis is the name of the program that NASA is developing now. There's the Apollo logo on the left, the Artemis logo on the right. A couple of quick things to say. They like to point out that the A in Artemis, which looks like a spacecraft, points beyond the moon because it's going to go on to Mars. But this is the first stepping stone. It's boiled down into three missions coming up in very short, uh, very near term. Uh, Tony, you want to say what they are, Artemis yes. 1? <clears throat> Artemis 1 will take the Orion uh, capsule, which NASA actually is just about completed for this mission, uh, a capsule that can carry between four and seven crew members at some point, and a service module with an engine on it built by the European Space Agency. And this uh, craft will be launched hopefully in 2021 on the SLS, the uh, uh, large uh, booster that NASA has been working on. And uh, this will loop around the moon, actually orbit the moon, and then change orbits uh, to much higher orbit and spend about 46 days in space. Then that will be followed by the first crewed mission? That's right, crewed. The next mission, Artemis II, will use the same hardware uh, but with a crew of up to four people and fly around the moon and then back to the Earth. Uh, just loop around the moon, straight back to the Earth, and then hit the atmosphere at 25,000 miles per hour and make sure it all works. And then finally leading to 2024. Uh, and on the, the upper craft is called the Gateway. Uh, a couple parts of it have are, are already funded and we already have uh, um, contractors selected for them. Uh, it's sort of a space station that'll be placed about 10,000 miles or so from the moon, but it's a destination for the Orion capsule with the crew to go to and uh, as yet unveiled, uh, unveiled, uh, not, uh, I'm sorry, undetermined lunar lander uh, to take that crew to the surface and then back to the gateway. Although there's a lot of lunar lander development going on in the private sector. Right. So, so Artemis 3 is to get people just on the moon, just so we, so we can say we've done it again, we're able to do it, and get them back quickly. <laughs> so two little things to say about it. One is that Artemis is Apollo's sister. And you've heard NASA, if you've heard them talking about it, they're going to put a woman on the moon, finally. Um, and the other thing to say about it is that it's targeted for the South Pole, again, because it's thought there may be water resources there. So these are some different things. Uh, Apollo didn't go to the South Pole, but Artemis is planning to go to the uh, uh, South Pole, uh, which is a stepping stone. I'm not going to go through all of the particular issues, but to the idea that perhaps downstream we may, in fact, be able to have habitats and a future um, on the moon. We had a couple of panels, as I mentioned, on the left there with Tony and me is um, Leonard David, who was our speaker the next night on uh, Sunday, did a, a book talk of his book, Moon Rush, which covers all of this material. So if you're really interested in the next steps, both near term with Artemis and long term, I can recommend, uh, there are a few left, he signed the ones that remained after his book signing, he signed and they're in the bookstore, you can go get them. Uh, and, uh, and in fact, even since he did his talk, there have been updates. How many of you saw Five, this? Four, launch from the Indian three, Space Research two, Organization. One, zero. Successful launch from India. And this mission is also going to the South Pole of the Moon. People realize the South Pole is going to be where it's at, so to speak. So keep an eye on that. That mission is underway right now. Um, there was another photo event on Monday with the observatory's director talking about the philosophy and the impact and meaning of having gone to the moon. And that brings us now to our final story of the evening, uh, 
our celebration of 50 years ago today, the end of the Apollo 11 mission. So indeed, uh, the mission uh, <laughs> launched from the moon. And Patrick, you want to say a little bit about this video here? Uh, that's right. So this is Artis conception of uh, the lunar module uh, blasting off from the moon, returning the astronauts into orbit. And this is uh, taken from the 16 millimeter camera as they ascended above the moon. And then uh, later on, uh, Michael Collins filmed the lunar module uh, just turning around and docking. And once docked, the, the two astronauts transferred back to the, uh, to the command and service module. Now, uh, at the beginning, uh, when we saw the ascent, we didn't see the ascent directly from the surface. And that was because uh, Buzz Aldrin forgot to turn his camera on. Uh, actually, he should have turned his camera on while on the surface, according to the flight plan, but he forgot. And so he only did that 16 seconds later. So um, there was a lot of anxious moments um, in the lunar module before that. And in fact, a few hours before, um, they had a, a very uh, nervous moment when, uh, Neil, um, when Armstrong, uh, actually uh, Aldrin was taking off his, uh, his uh, backpack, his uh, uh, life support pack. He, uh, his life support uh, pack actually hit a switch on a, a circuit uh, breaker uh, panel on the lunar module. And of all the switches uh, that could have got broken, it was this one called uh, engine arm. What does that mean? <laughs> well, that was the <coughs> switch um, that would actually arm the engine of the ascent stage of the lunar module for them to take off. So if, this, if the circuit breaker was on the, in the open position, kind of off, um, they could not launch from the, from the, uh, from the surface of the moon. So um, in a, they reported this to uh, Mission Control, and Mission Control didn't know what to do about it. So uh, they tried to figure out how to make sure that circuit breaker was closed so they could actually launch uh, from the moon. And so uh, Buzz Aldrin, and actually, uh, yes, Buzz, Buzz Aldrin uh, took a pen from his pocket and thought, maybe I should just try to jam this into the uh, circuit breaker. That, and, and he did, and uh, he, he successfully, whether the circuit breaker was armed or not, uh, uh, it was actually uh, used this pen and armed the circuit breaker. So that this allowed him to get off the moon. This pen, incidentally, is on display at the Museum of Flight in uh, Seattle. So if you ever go there, take a look, because this <laughs> was uh, one of the untold stories of Apollo 11 uh, <laughs> that actually saved the mission, too. So they said goodbye so, to the moon? Yes, this is a picture taken. Uh, oh, uh, so, sorry. yep, it's fine. The look, quick look back at the moon, which loomed large in the sky as they moved away from it. And then ahead of them was the Earth as it got closer and closer uh, for the uh, approach to Earth. And the descent was like this. So the uh, top part, uh, that conical part, which is a command module, separated from the rest of the surface module. And the uh, surf uh, command module re-entered the Earth's atmosphere, uh, re-entered the Earth's atmosphere in a blazing fireball. Um, the heat shield experienced 4,000 degrees um, Fahrenheit temperature, and then eventually the parachutes deployed and they splashed down into the ocean. So that was 50 years ago today, and uh, we know that Buzz had that camera on his side, and he ca captured this footage. I like this home movie feel that he's got there. He's got a little test pattern. So they're approaching Earth. It skips a little bit here as it comes in. This is taken out his window. And then they go into the shadow of the Earth. You'll see a little crescent Earth there. And as they uh, travel in orbit uh, and go on to the, into the darkness on the night side of the Earth, the crescent fades away. And in just a few minutes, they moments, they reach uh, the top of the atmosphere, and you'll see it. So it starts to glow. Now we're not paying, playing the full video of this whole thing because there's it's quite a lot of glow out his window, and you know you think, well, I've just been to the moon, and ah, it's all all downhill from here. But still, a lot of drama. Here's some radio we're with three minutes twenty seconds since entry. Uh, blackout should end about three minutes fifty three seconds uh, after entry. So blackout means they had radio blackout. They couldn't communicate. We're about no, eleven minutes away from landing. No radio communications. Apollo eleven, uh, Houston, through a 
and they're trying to establish communication. They never Houston, did standing by. Over. during this phase. But visual contact. But they haven't talked to them yet, so they can see the spacecraft coming in. They don't know what's happened inside. So. The Hornet now reports a visual contact. Visual contact from the recovery ship. So the Hornet is the ship in the Pacific that is uh, out there waiting to recover. And then David found this footage today. Hit him again. That works. You're going to call us when you get around for that. This is the visual contact. You can see the time elapsed 195 hours into the mission. It looks like the, command, the uh, service module. So trying to track that as they came in. So the uh, command module um, did land in the ocean, but it landed upside down. And so they deployed these uh, um, essentially balloons, large flotation devices, which turned it right side up. And after it was a wonderful story and it's a great video on YouTube if you're interested in this sort of thing about the, the frogmen and the people who went, uh, you know, what they had to do, the training and the prep in very, very rough seas to uh, recover the astronauts. Yes. There's a neat story I saw from a friend of ours, another astronomer, Katie Mack, who's called into us on Skype, that her grandfather played a role in this. He was analyzing spy satellite images, noticed there was a storm right where they had originally planned to come in, contacted NASA and said, you need to change where Apollo 11's coming in, and you just have to trust me. I can't tell you how I know, but you need to move it, and they <laughs> did. It's a fascinating story. You can find it on a podcast where she gets to tell the story, and I recommend you do that, but NASA evidently flew a helicopter or something over there, and there was a giant thunderstorm that might have torn the parachutes right off the capsule as it came in, had they have come through that storm. And so. in fact, I have to uh, issue a correction, it might be to you, about whether they came a direct landing or they took a little skip. And indeed, they did take a little skip off the atmosphere, just a little bounce, in order to change their landing. If they had been direct and they would have gone into that spot. So they did a little bounce to land, uh, I think, about 250 miles beyond? Like yeah. Something like that. Something like that. So the Hornet, the ship had to steam like crazy to get there in time and, and pick up the crew, but, uh, but they did. Mission Control was very happy. Yes, much cheering. And celebrations rang out when they weren't supposed to, when they were on duty. <laughs> and then you'd think you just came back from this trip and all you want to do is breathe the beautiful fresh air of Earth and hug your wife. But no, they had to go back into a different tin can. <laughs> yeah, 21 days of isolation, quarantine. Um, they were worried about lunar bugs, essentially, little microbes that maybe somehow could survive in the dirt or dust and make people sick. So into the trailer where they communicated with the president through the you know, window there and talked to him. They talked to their wives through the window. They were in Hawaii, by the way. That's why they have the beautiful flowers. Um, they actually had to go through customs. So this is a real customs form here that, if you look closely, departure from the moon, arrival, Honolulu, Hawaii. So yeah, they took it seriously. If you look in there, they also had to document moon rock and moon dust samples were their cargo they brought in. So they <laughs> um, This isn't a hoax. It was tweeted by Buzz Aldrin himself. So this is not a ho hoax. So again, major celebrations, ticker tape parade. This mention in oh, oh, go ahead. Oh, I just want to mention in Alameda near San San Francisco is the Hornet, the same aircraft carrier, and they have a permanent museum to Apollo there, and you can see they actually have the footprints or from the helicopter to the van marked out, you know, on the floor, <laughs> and they have one of the the. Uh, uh, quarantine vans, not the actual one that was used on Apollo 11, but one of the later Apollo uh, quarantine vans is there. All kinds of models and stuff, and uh, continuously playing CBS coverage and all kinds of stuff there. And a great ship to, to see. 
So with that, we brought to conclusion today our Stations of Apollo and brought our, uh, our own Apollo 11 back to Earth. So we have a little video of that. You can see the pinpoint landing here. Space, we actually have a section of the heat shield. <laughs> 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 So with that, our, our Apollo 11 mission profile was complete. So, um, so let me just say, uh, uh, for all of you who participated in this, and some of you who came back multiple times, thank you so much. Um, we not only felt we wanted to bring the Apollo 11 astronauts all the way home, I know a lot of celebrations ended over the weekend, we wanted to bring them home safely. Um, but we're also going to be celebrating all the future missions. Here are the other missions that uh, took place through the rest of the Apollo um, program, and we will be celebrating each and every one of them. Uh, so November 14th for Apollo 12 is our next one. And, uh, and <laughs> then, um, of course, we resume back to normal life, uh, our all space considered on the 2nd of August. So for those of you who come to that program, we look forward to seeing you. Now we have to come up with a whole bunch of new content uh, in two weeks, but we'll do it. And we look forward to having you join us. And thank you again, all of you, for coming tonight.